Alex, it seems it's not the emissions that green movement is preoccupied with. It seems they're just against cheap, reliable energy. I think that's exactly right, although it's counterintuitive to people because people think, oh, the green movement, they just want just as much energy or even more, but without any kind of harmful emissions. But then you see, wait a second, they're against nuclear. They're against hydro. And they're also against the mining involved in solar and wind and the transmission lines and the infrastructure. And what you see is the green movement is an they're not an anti-emissions movement. They're not an anti-harmful emissions movement. They're an anti-human impact movement. So their hostility is toward human impact mm. as such. And if you think human impact is a bad thing, energy is the worst thing because energy powers all these machines whose very purpose is to impact the earth to make it a better place for us. Now, I think that's great, but I don't hate human impact. I love it, provided it's it's intelligent. But the green movement is really an impact-hating movement. So that's why event that's why they have to oppose every form of cost-effective energy. Now you've described solar and wind as unreliable parasites of reliable energy. But we've got Western governments completely focused on these technologies. Why is that? If they're so unreliable, if they're so expensive, why haven't the Western governments uh, caught on to this uh, fairly critical bit of information? I think in many ways because they're unreliable, because they're expensive. Uh, my belief is that the, the impact-hating movement, sometimes called the environmental movement, it's the only source of energy it ever supports is imaginary energy. So as you, you mentioned, there's support of nuclear until that becomes truly cost effective. There's support of natural gas until it becomes really cost effective globally, and then it becomes called then it becomes fracking and it gets it gets demonized. So th there's there's this opposition toward impact, and that that drives everything. So solar and wind, they are one, they're not really cost effective today. So it ends up with people using less energy. But B, it allows this vision of solar and wind and this pretense that they're somehow green. This allows the green energy movement to safely oppose fossil fuels, nuclear, and hydro and still get away with being seen as pro-energy. If they were seen as anti-energy, then the jig would be up. Now, amidst the net zero madness, we have some signs of sanity. The board of Shell made it clear at their recent AGM that oil and gas are better investments than renewables when it uh, comes to shareholder value, and 80% of the shareholders agreed. Uh, but, of course, Alex, the market isn't an even playing field. The market is corrupted with the taxpayer funds that are being pumped into renewable subsidies. And yet, even with that, they're making these calculations. So if you want to ask, well, why was Shell so gung-ho about so-called renewables? Same thing with BP. And now you see they're, they're pulling back on that. Well, there was just such mm. an amount of government support that people feel like, well, of course it has to work. Of course I see dollar signs here. But the thing is, just for various reasons, the unreliable solar and wind, even with those huge subsidies, are not as good an investment as fossil fuels often are, which are, are real energy. Now, interestingly, there's a paradoxical element, seemingly, where by the, by the green movement opposing fossil fuels, they restrict the supply, and that makes the price go up, and that makes the profits go up, and that makes mm. people try to go into it more. So in a sense, you know, the, the statist anti-fossil fuel movement is at least certain companies' best friend, certain fossil fuel companies' best friend. Yeah, that is a strange development. Now, I want to bring to your attention, oh, you may have already seen this, the World Economic Forum's agenda contributor and CEO of uh, Rabo Carbon Bank, Barbara Basma. She's pushing for a personal carbon allowance, and here she explains how it would work. En krijgt daardoor een beetje meer geld. Of diegene woont in een kleiner huurhuis en ik woon in een groot huis. Ik heb dus meer uitstootrechten nodig om mijn huis te verwarmen. Mm -hmm. En zo kunnen mensen met een smalle port. Alex, your response to a personal carbon allowance. I mean, I can't think of a better example 
of how elitist this movement is. The poor can sell their carbon credits to have enough money to perhaps, I don't know, heat their homes. And the wealthy can buy these carbon credits to jet around the world and live the sort of lifestyle that they want to live. I mean, this is not a selling point, I wouldn't have thought, but she's putting it out there as, uh, as something that we should be embracing. I mean, there's so many problems with this. So one is, this is just a pure, pure entryway toward totalitarianism, right? Because once they're counting carbon, giving you credits, then they can decide what to do. They can decide to ban things or they can make the thing infinitely expensive. And that just is going to make life worse Ooh. forever. No one, you know, I mean, maybe Soros will be able to take a plane flight, but almost nobody else will, yeah. will be able to. This is, but it, the view of energy this person has is so wrong because the way she views energy is, oh, energy is just this kind of incidental thing. And if we make it more expensive and have these credits, then that'll be nice. But what, is, what gives the money value? The money is valuable because of how productive we are, and we're, pro we're productive in proportion to how much energy we can deploy to power machines that make us far more productive, I mean, infinitely more productive than with manual labor. So if you're basically just making energy super expensive, and we don't have a viable alternative to fossil fuels for you know the 6 billion people who use very little energy, you're just going to make everything more expensive. So it's no favor to poor people to make the whole world unproductive and then say, hey, we're going to give you some, like, in effect, Zimbabwe dollars. Like, the money isn't worth anything if you're not productive. <laughs> And as you've pointed out uh, a number of times, it is the poorest in the world who need energy more than anybody. They, they, they need it to lift themselves from poverty. They haven't had the advantages we've had with cheap, reliable energy. And it seems, Alex, that the developing world is not even a consideration for these environmentalists. They don't care about the plight of the world's poorest people. Well, I think it's a rhetorical consideration. So you notice that when they talk about climate change, they'll say, oh, well, you know, this is, we're so concerned about it's, you know, the floods in these places. Anytime there's anything climate related that happens to poor people, it's, oh my gosh, we care so much. But if you care about people's safety from climate, and if you care about people broadly, they need energy for everything, including to deal with climate. So it's just a total lie to say, oh, I love these poor people so much, so I'm going to prevent everyone from using fossil fuels. That'll make it so great for floods, because what, nature is not going to have floods anymore? No, they're going to have floods, <laughs> but they have no chance at flood prevention and flood protection infrastructure like we have, which makes us safer from floods ever. And actually, we've also made the poor world safer from floods than ever. So this is just, it's, it's a rhetorical concern. So they're using people's concern about poorer people to advocate policies that will make everyone's life worse, but the poorest people's lives will get worst of all. Alex, there's an article in the Australian Financial Review which claims that ESG goals are absolutely fundamental to the long-term growth of the economy and it calls on Australia to identify export industries such as green hydrogen and renewable energy and then back them hard. Uh, what's your response to that advice? I think your point of view may be a tad different. I love how they make this like world destroying movement innocuous by putting Scrabble letters. It's like, oh, this is just a, a crappy <laughs> Scrabble word. It's not something that we should be uh, afraid of. I mean, God, ESG, I, so much to say about this. It's like this whole idea that these random bureaucrats from the UN who hate freedom and hate industry have come up with a set of rules that is going to make everyone prosperous. How could anyone possibly believe this in theory, let alone if you look at the practice where ESG means be anti-fossil fuel, be anti-nuclear, be anti-development. It basically says refrain from everything that you have every reason to think is profitable on a free market and embark on all these schemes that governments can barely get themselves to do like green hydrogen. Is there like an amazing market? Have people really figured out how to rig solar panels and wind turbines so there's super cheap hydrogen we're transporting? It? No, this is just a total like government phenomenon that's stealing people's money to pay for these boondoggles. And so it's, it's kind of like Shell we mentioned earlier. They're basically 
shell in the past. They're saying, oh, well, we have this, like the government's giving out money, so we should do this. But as like Australia, do things that are actually cost effective for billions of people, like producing coal, that seems to be pretty profitable right now. Like don't do things that you think stupid governments are going to fleece their taxpayers to buy from you. That's not a moral strategy and it's not usually a practical strategy. Alex Epstein, yeah. always a pleasure to get your insights. Thank you for joining me today.